So I'd like to thank my colleagues for their conspicuous good timing and all showing up in the right place at the right time virtually. Um, my name is Ian Dolphin. I'm Perio Di uh, Foundation Executive Director. Um, remember, please, to ask questions using the Open Perio 21 hashtag on Twitter or in the screen on front of you. Um, the Aperio incubation process doesn't always get the attention it deserves. Yet in the last five years, it's graduated nine new Aperio software communities and set them on the path to sustainability. It plays a pretty vital role in fulfilling Aperio's mission. So we thought we would provide this short plenary session to enable you to get to know incubation, some of the folks involved in incubation, a little better. And I'm joined today by Benita Gonzalez, chair of our incubation working group, Didi Hurricane from Maris College, and Sam Lee Pan from the University of Cape Town. I've been active in the group for some time. Uh, maybe introduce ourselves first, Benita. Hi, my name is Benita Gonzalez. I've been involved with uh, open source software since Wow, has it been 15 years? Maybe longer, uh, 2005. Um, in particular, uh, CAS, uPortal, and Sakai in those early days, and now I mostly focus on uPortal. Um, but uh, all, all that has just inspired me to get involved with incubation, and so that's why I'm here. Great, Didi? Hi, everyone. My name is Dee Dee Hurricane. I'm the manager of instructional technology at Marist College. Um, I uh, have been part of the Sakai community for about 14 years. And a few years ago, uh, I got to join the um, Aperio community as a mentor. Thanks, Dee Dee. Sam? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Sam Lee Pan from the Learning Technologies team in the University of Cape Town. So I've been working with Sakai for the past around seven years, so since I've been involved with the team. Um, and we also run a whole lot of other um, Aperio projects, such as OpenCast, we're a big user of that, um, Tiggy, and also we're piloting some, such as OnTask and Certi. Thanks very much. So we've got just a few slides. Uh, to give you some background on the incubation process, which I'm going to run through. Then we're going to have some chat show-like sessions about incubation, where you find out some of the motivations of people involved in the process itself. But first of all, let's make sure we're all on the same page. So our incubation process is designed to play a part in the formative stages of the path from innovation to sustainability for a new software project or community. That's from the written process, which you can find on the web. I'm going to start with what incubation isn't to get some of the misconceptions out of the way. First of all, there are a number of business models you can deploy around open source software. Our incubation process is not a business model provider. That's something which we don't want to be overly prescriptive about. We encourage people to explore different models, but it's not a business model provider. It's not prescriptive in the sense of here are 10 steps to follow to achieve software sustainability. That isn't how it works. And it isn't a volunteer generator. The idea is to teach people to fish not to provide them with fish. So our mentors aren't there to do things for the projects. They're there to be critical friends, to be external voices, and to bring different ideas to a project. And finally, uh, it goes without saying, an incubation process isn't magic, and neither is it for every software project at every stage of development. And it has to be said that if a project enters incubation and doesn't successfully graduate it, that's not necessarily a bad thing. If we found out that uh, a particular piece of software doesn't suit a need in higher education, then we've saved the sector some money. What it is, is a means of access and collective experience of both success and failure. And that's written down in guidance, which you can find at that web address. You find it very easily on the Aperio website. And as I said, volunteer incubation mentors act as critical friends to an incubating project. Uh, 
can be a big time saver if a multi-partner project is involved. Uh, I don't know how many of you have been involved in multi-institution projects, but they usually get bogged down from time to time in conversations about, for example, management of intellectual property that the project generates. The Aperio incubation process, because of its structured guidance on intellectual property rights managing, management, avoids that. And Aperio acts as a, a neutral legal entity to share intellectual property with and through. The guidance that we offer ranges from quite hard edge guidance to guidance which is more soft edged. So to look at a few examples of that, licensing is pretty hard edged. We want comp corporate and individual contributor agreements to cover intellectual property. This both asserts the right to share, it says this is our my work, but also those agreements give a perio an irrevocable right to share contributions in perpetuity. So it's important from the perspective of the project and from the perspective of potential adopters. A little less hard edged. We have a number of tools and we've worked with an organization that used to be part of JISC in the UK and now is an independent entity at the University of Oxford called Open Source Software Watch. And they have some cool tools which let you explore different governance models. Aperio doesn't insist on a single governance model. We're very clear that governance has to exist, it has to suit the project, and it has to be agreed. But we don't have a kind of single model that we insist on. So the, the effort is all there about encouraging exploration. And perhaps more soft edge still, uh, incubation is about growing community, learning from the experience of other projects and mentors. And that's actually quite soft edge. It's structured into a series of stages. There's a possible pre-incubation phase where putative project might put some information out about itself on our lists or via the website and establish if there's significant interest from another institution. To become a sponsored incubating project, two members have to sponsor uh, a project. That's not financial sponsorship. That's simply two members putting their hand up and saying, we think in our judgment, this is worthwhile. And we've not yet had a, an example of that being done in a, in a frivolous way. The application then has to be approved by the incubation working group and the incubation board. Uh, we want consensus around that. If we're using Aperio resources, then we want to use them wisely and carefully. Um, we then, when a project enters incubation, use the written incubation process, the one that you can see on the web that I provided a link to, to effectively assess the status of the project. We establish a timeline by consensus with the project, but that's a timeline for guidance only. You don't get kicked out if you're not finished in the 18 months or six months or 12 months that you thought was a, a reasonable uh, assessment. And we assign mentors from the incubation working group and schedule review meetings. And the frequency of those meetings varies from project to project. Graduation from the incubation process occurs when the process criteria are met. So a project gains benefit from the process by gaining access to that experience. Again, some very tangible benefits. You don't have to worry about intellectual property management in the sense of establishing a system. There's a system there to adopt. It also demonstrates the actions that incubating projects have taken to adopters, like intellectual property cleanliness, like establishing clear governance. And that's kind of a big deal. If you're adopt an adopter, you want to know the health of a, a software community or a software project. In terms of where we go next, we're currently considering a range of things. First of all, the process is based on experience. It's not set in stone. So we regularly review the process and refresh it, carefully but regularly. 
It's a fact as well, I think, that many mentors have noted that the pandemic has slowed incubation at a time when conceivably you could say it needs to speed up. So there's a tension there between the needs of the individual institution and the sector as a whole. And it's a fact, I think, uh, I observed earlier that we've seen reduced volunteer effort uh, made available to project incubation due to institutional priorities. And that's no surprise, given what everybody's been through over the last 18 months. But it does raise some questions which we want to address in an inclusive way. Uh, some of the potential solutions that have been spoken about up to now are an increase in the number of self-help materials available. There's an overhead involved in that, of course. Uh, to recruit more mentors, and I hope that you're sufficiently interested by this session to think about becoming an, an incubation mentor. And with that, I think it's time to go over to talk to some of the incubation mentors uh, and find out their perspective on some of the work that they've been involved in. So I'll give folks a couple of minutes to fire up their video windows again. So uh, let's do this in the reverse order. Sam, what attracted you to volunteer as an incubation mentor? What do you get out? What did you get out of it personally? What have you learned? Um, so my interest in open source software actually stems back to um, before joining higher education. I was in GIS, uh, Geographical Information Systems, and there was a very strong open source project um, that I was involved in, fortunately, in that time. Um, and I think my, yeah, my passion for open source has kind of drew me to the incubation group. Um, I feel the incubation group is, it's, it's fundamental to Aperio. Um, it helps um, grow the community. It's, we already have a strong community, but it just allows for a lot more potential and network um what i have personally gained through this is to be involved with other volunteers that have been just as much as enthusiastic and really you know that that want to to contribute to that change so i've really enjoyed being part of the group in that in that context yeah. thanks Dee. Dee. Well, uh, I can speak that to my history that uh, I was working in the Sakai quality assurance area of things, and I responded to an email for a call for mentors. Um, I didn't know that this would entail prior to volunteering, um, but one thing nice about an open source community is that it's very welcoming. Uh, I read the Aperio incubation and introduction, um, and these pages talked about the process, and I was even unsure if I could help because I didn't know anything about it, um, but that I was hoping I could participate and, and learn. So uh, I was welcomed at the meetings with some of the members who are here on this group. And um, I was even able to shadow some of them. So I was able to learn quite a lot, including you. Thank you very much, Ian Dolphin. Um, and then um, what I got out of it, uh, it offered me so an, an opportunity to connect with the Aperio community in a manner I hadn't expected. Um, in the past, uh, everything gets a little bit siloed if you're in one particular project. So being able to attend the conferences is fantastic, but uh, being able to actually meet with people as they bring a, a, a project on board or prior to them bringing a project on board allowed me to know the people themselves. And even this project of just doing the Aperio conference allowed me to meet with um, others. Uh, and as you were saying earlier, the training that had been offered, I believe it was by uh, Rowan and Scott Wilson from Oxford, uh, that was incredibly helpful to help me understand the governance models in free and open source software, how to look at it from a community, a software community perspective, 
the day-to-day -day roadmap of what their work should be like to keep moving forward. It was a wonderful way of learning some leadership skills. Thanks, Didi. Benita? So my experience is uh, around development and coding, so kind of heads down, but I do have a, a natural tendency to interact with people, and I knew open source projects had so much more to offer rather than just source code. And so that's what really drew me into incubation. I was part of an incubation group with JSIG, um, a former organization to uh, uh, Perio. Uh, and that was that was great, just learning about the governance and, and how really a community is it's is what's important when it comes to an open source project. Uh, and then having the opportunity to join incubation working group uh, under a, a Perio uh, was, was just a, a a simple, simple choice, simple decision, and and just to continue interacting with great people in this community, um, and and it's just that's really what excites me now. I, I mean, I love coding, and I I want to get back to, you know, spending half a day doing that, but the other half is just. Um, interacting with these phenomenal folks. Look at these smiles. I mean, it's it's just that's what makes uh, all this effort worthwhile. Thanks very much. Dee Dee, how did the, um, you mentioned the onboarding process, but how, how did that process work for you? What else would you pick out of it? Oh, I, I actually used the um, slides from that uh, session uh, over and over as we have grown in the incubation process. Um, I believe it was called OSS Watch. And um, so I did not realize, what does it take to start a project? Let's say I had a great idea um, about software, not that I code like Benito, but uh, how would I build it? And then I realized back when we'd started or when I was invited to join, um, it was the question was ask the, qu the questions of the project that they might not have thought of. And by watching the onboarding process, I believe it was Open Aquella, um, this allowed me to see how they've grown and how they're still growing over time. Um, so being a mentor showed me that governance model, but it gave me a structure to learn from. So as I applied it to a, an onboarding uh, project, I could say, oh, we, we're missing this little thing. Have you guys thought about uh, how you want to look at the rules of um, of, of people who might want to say, I want more of a leadership position, or how would I be mentored? Thinking of those things was, was not something I'd ever considered until I took the uh, app actual training for the day. So it did allow me to also meet with, you know, like Ablardo and Dragon and, and um, from OnTask. The videos for those of you who are on the uh, session are posted uh, in TriSky. Um, but these were unique educators uh, that I would not have met if I had been outside of this process. Um, now I've taken a deep dive back into the software thinking, gosh, you know, I haven't looked at this in a little while. I should be looking back at it. How did they build out their community? Um, and this global community of like-minded educators, you know, sharing their ideas is one of the biggest takeaways I've seen from being a mentor. Thank you. Benito. Okay, I'm unmuted now. Um, <laughs> I, I was I was asking what was the question again? The um, the onboarding process. How did it How did it work for you? What do you pull out of it? What sticks in your mind? Yeah, I would I would echo uh, what Dee Dee said. The OSS Watch was one of those things that just there was so much good information. And I and again I I had a background already. Um, and that just really solidified uh, a lot of ideas and concepts and, and how to assist uh, an incubating project. Um, there is, uh, I don't want to say a lot of pitfalls, but there are certain areas that each group kind of uh, focuses on. And then there's other areas where um, they, they certainly um, need some uh, assistance and guidance. And that's really where we, where we come in and having the that kind of background knowledge and um, training uh, to help us uh, just see what are the broad strokes out there in the different communities. And then our our own 
experiences and shadowing others in these projects allows us to really that our, our own uh, experiences and takeaway. So that's what we're bringing as mentors is really um, we've seen things um, and we can share those uh, as needed with particular projects and not overload them with a lot of information. We've certainly got some some high level onboarding information, um, but you know the practical views of, of how other groups have, have worked through the process um, really allow us to assist others. Thanks. Sam, why did you feel about onboarding and what worked for you particularly? Sure. So um, again, similarly, I think the OSS Watch um, induction was really great. Um, but also the being able to shadow someone. Um, so like Didi said, like when I came, I knew nothing about incubation. Um, and you learn it all from scratch and and being in sessions where there's like a senior mentor and you learn also through that um, and having a very supportive group um, that that you can lean on if there are questions. Um, I really also learned from some of the discussions, um, seeing new projects emerge, how to evaluate them, whether they're the right fit. Um, and yeah, just as Didi's mentioned, also those network points between projects is really fascinating. So, yeah. That's great. Now, I mean, there's a very open-ended question which I posed in the slides, which we're certainly not going to manage to, uh, to answer in this session. But it's clear that incubation has slowed in the pandemic right at the point where you would anticipate that it was needed to a greater extent. So, how should we work in times like we have to better prepare for times like these that might occur again in the future? Uh, let's start with Benito. Yeah, and that's that's a, a challenging question. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I've given it some thought and it really it's about um, just being prepared with the uh, more self-help materials and and also a little advocacy, uh, really making sure that people like, like this session are aware of the incubation group, are aware of both sides of um, having these projects and these ideas, uh, what it kind of takes at a very high level just to get started, and at the very least, who to reach out to, right? We're, we're here. Uh, and then on the flip side, it's about um, sharing what it what it looks like to be a mentor. Um, that it's about the interest and not having experience or skill to start off with in this in this area. If you if you're really interested and passionate about open source and you want to be a mentor, we can ramp you up. You know, we we've, we've got videos, we we've, we've got ways to assist you. Um, Shadowing is certainly uh, one of the best ways to ramp folks up. So just kind of building those out and, and making sure the community is aware. You know, this is the incubation process and join it on either side and we'd love to have you. And we just need to keep echoing that, that message. Thanks, Sam. Thoughts on that issue? Yeah, definitely the advocacy. Um, and I think that like, even for the preparation for this conference, it was quite nice because we went back to some of the previous um, successful projects and looked at them and said, you know, what were your reflections on, on this process? Um, and to draw on that, um, so maybe to refine certain things in certain places, but also, you know, what are the benefits for people going through this process? Um, and yeah, I think just like looking at places we could streamline um, uh, advocacy in terms of information sessions, um, uh, marketing materials but essentially I think that there will be uh, a great need for uptake after the pandemic and it's about being ready for that um, to once people have enough time and headspace that's essentially where we can start like nurturing and growing and building for the future. That's a great thought. Didi? I think Sam took all the words out of my mouth, um, but I do agree wholeheartedly that we uh, we need to market the uh, this opportunity to a lot more, um, not only the groups who might be interested, but also to the groups that exist um, because they do know other people. And uh, 
I think they might not know who we are, except for plenty of our sessions such as these. Um, and I, I believe that we can do some self-help, uh, make it a little uh, less possibly overwhelming, but uh, maybe doing it in small chunks. And I think that would help uh, keep smaller projects from being uh, concerned about joining a big group such as this. That's great. Thank you. I've not seen many questions come in. Does anybody have a question to uh, to ask of the group while we're here? Well, while we wait for a question or two to come in, I'm going to plug the fact that there's a, an LMS time machine one hour workshop at 2 p.m. Eastern today and a social hour at 3.30 p.m. where we will play bingo. I am just very grateful, and you should be also, that there's not an opportunity for karaoke. Because no karaoke. <laughs> you do not want to hear us sing. Maybe it's a secret event happening somewhere. <laughs> well, if there are no questions, we're nearly on the hour and time to move on. Thanks to my colleagues here. Uh, thanks to you for attending, and see you at the later sessions. Thank you, Ian. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.